Hello and welcome to Working Historians, a podcast series where we discuss what historians do with their lives. I am Rob Denning, Associate Dean for Liberal Arts for Southern New Hampshire University's online history programs. It's Constitution Day 2023. In the grand tradition of Constitution Days in previous years, here is a special podcast episode where I'm going to reflect a bit on a particular component of the United States Constitution, the 14th Amendment. As many longtime listeners know, my master's thesis, completed way back in the mists of time, aka 2004, was on the state of California's failure to ratify the 14th Amendment to the Constitution when it was first presented to the states back in 1866. While that project focused mainly on that one state's reaction to the amendment, I remain fascinated by that five-paragraph edition to the Constitution, and I'm going to subject you all to that fascination here. So, break out your parchment, ink, and quills, get comfy, and let's talk about citizenship, due process, equal opportunity, voting rights, and everything in between. First, some context. Reconstruction. The great question facing Americans after the Civil War was what to do with those states that had seceded. Should they be readmitted to the Union with all of their pre-war rights intact, or should they be reconstructed in such a way that granted greater authority to the federal government so that the states could never again threaten the Union? During the war, President Abraham Lincoln had put forth his 10% plan, which pardoned and restored property to former rebels who swore an oath of allegiance to the United States. When 10% of those who voted in the 1860 election in a seceded state took that oath, they could then reestablish that state government with the Lincoln administration's blessing. Lincoln believed that the states were indestructible and should be quickly reinstated with all the rights granted to them by the Constitution, but he was concerned about the people who would form that state government. Lincoln had insisted throughout the war that the people had rebelled, not the states, and that while the people could be punished for rebellion, the states never lost their constitutional rights and powers. Many liberal Republicans, known as radical Republicans because they wanted to go further than Lincoln and other mainstream Republicans in remaking Southern society, criticized Lincoln for this plan because they believed that it was too lenient towards the traitorous Southerners. Those same Republicans praised Andrew Johnson, who inherited the presidency after Lincoln's assassination, because he had called for strict punishment of the rebels during his time in Congress and as vice president. The radical Republicans believed that he shared their desire to remake Southern society after the war, but they were incorrect. Johnson had been a Democrat throughout his political career, and he had been added to Lincoln's presidential ticket in 1864 in order to project an image of a bipartisan administration. After Lincoln's death, Johnson continued some of Lincoln's policies, but he also reasserted his democratic principles. Throughout his career, Johnson had stated that he wanted to punish the slave-owning aristocrats and break their power in the South, but he had no intention of granting citizenship or suffrage to freed slaves after the war. Himself a former slave owner, Johnson was a firm believer in the superiority of the white race. Johnson supported the rights of states to bestow citizenship or suffrage on their own citizens, and, according to historian Eric Foner, believed that, uh, quote, the federal government lacked the authority to impose black suffrage and civil rights upon the states, and that the status of blacks must not become an obstacle to the speedy completion of Reconstruction. Johnson shared Lincoln's belief that the states were indestructible and should have their rights restored as quickly as possible. In addition to embracing the provisions of Lincoln's 10% plan, Johnson offered amnesty and the restoration of property to ex-Confederates who swore an oath of loyalty to the Union. Johnson also agreed with Lincoln that Reconstruction was a function of the executive branch because the Constitution gave only the President the authority to grant pardons and to enforce the laws. Radicals in Congress criticized Johnson's policy, as they had Lincoln's, because it did not adequately punish the ex-Confederates. Radical Republicans such as Benjamin Wade and Charles Sumner were disappointed that the new president's Reconstruction policy did not guarantee the freedom and rights of the freed blacks in the South. The freedom that Johnson's Reconstruction policy granted to the Southern states allowed for the creation of black codes, which attempted to maintain the racial hierarchy by discriminating against blacks through segregation, vagrancy laws, criminal prosecutions, 
limits on land ownership, and restrictions on occupational advancement. The radicals disagreed with Johnson's assertion that the executive branch should handle Reconstruction and began to pursue their own Reconstruction policies. The Radical Congress passed three Reconstruction Amendments after the war ended. The least controversial of these was the 13th Amendment, which outlawed slavery in all of its forms, except for punishment for a crime. Although the amendment constituted a revolutionary change in a society that had accepted slavery to varying degrees since colonial times, it was ratified with little controversy because, by the end of the Civil War, both North and South knew that slavery would not survive the defeat of the Confederacy. Many radical Republicans hoped that equality before the law for both whites and blacks, would come with the end of slavery, but this was a vain hope because no enforcement mechanisms were prescribed in that 13th Amendment. The end of slavery was not enough to guarantee freed blacks the equal protection of the laws. As Frederick Douglass argued, quote, slavery is not abolished until the black man has the ballot, end quote. Supplemental legislation would have to be enacted to guarantee the equal protection of the laws and suffrage to the newly freed blacks. According to Eric Foner, Congress enacted the first Civil Rights Act in 1866 as a, quote, attempt to give meaning to the 13th Amendment to define in legislative terms the essence of freedom, end quote. The 10th Constitution to the United States Constitution, though, only allowed the federal government to interfere with a state government in specific instances, and the protection of civil rights was not one of those specific instances listed in the Constitution. The new law left the enforcement of civil rights to the states and did not allow for federal intervention. President Johnson vetoed the Civil Rights Act because, since Congress did not have the constitutional authority to enforce it, the legislation was effectively a waste of time, although Congress later passed it over his veto. With the passage of the Civil Rights Act, though, the radicals in Congress still faced the issue of enforcement, and in order to circumvent the Tenth Amendment and its restrictions on federal intervention in state matters, they decided to amend the Constitution to allow for federal jurisdiction over the enforcement of civil rights. The 14th Amendment, as passed by Congress in 1866, gave the federal government the authority to intervene in state affairs over issues of civil rights. The amendment's primary purpose was to force states to grant the same rights to their citizens that the Constitution granted to United States citizens as a whole. Prior to the passage of the 14th Amendment, the Bill of Rights only protected people from violations at the federal level. The states could disregard those rights at will. According to Foner, Congress fashioned the 14th Amendment to, quote, give constitutional sanction to states' obligations to respect such key provisions as freedom of speech, the right to bear arms, trial by impartial jury, and protection against cruel and unusual punishment and unreasonable search and seizure, end quote. The amendment gave broader authority to the federal government at the expense of state governments. A state's right to allocate suffrage and enforce civil rights now became subject to federal law and jurisdiction. So here's section one of the 14th Amendment. All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the law. The essence of the entire amendment lies in that first section, which defines all people born or naturalized in the United States as citizens of the nation and the state in which they reside. It also guarantees those citizens the right to due process and equal protection of the laws. This section was intended to protect blacks from Southerners who attempted to segregate or discriminate against them. Section 1 was highly controversial during the ratification debates because it was widely assumed that the granting of citizenship was the same as granting the right to vote, and many white Americans, although glad to be rid of slavery, were not ready to embrace the freed blacks as equals at the ballot box. Section 2 Representatives shall be apportioned among the several states according to their respective numbers, counting the whole number of persons in each state, excluding Indians not taxed. But when the right to vote at any election for the choice of electors for president or vice president of the United States, representatives in Congress, the executive and judicial officers of a state, 
or the members of the legislature thereof, is denied to any of the male inhabitants of such state, being 21 years of age and citizens of the United States, or in any way abridged, except for participation in rebellion or other crime, the basis of representation thereon shall be reduced in the proportion which the number of such male citizens shall bear to the whole number of male citizens 21 years of age in such states. Now, <laughs> that's, that's quite a mouthful. <laughs> now, the amendment did not specifically grant the freed blacks the right to vote, um, as that segment, or as that, that section noted. This power remained at the state level. The framers of the law's second section, which decreed that the state's congressional representation would thenceforth be num based on the number of voters in that state, hoped to motivate the states to grant the right to vote to all males in order to increase their representation in Congress, but the amendment did not force the states to do so. This section actually backfired on its supporters because some Southerners declared that they were perfectly willing to lose congressional seats in order to maintain their racial order. Southerners were not the only ones who were unconcerned with this provision. Section 2 also allowed the northern states to continue to withhold suffrage from blacks without penalty because, in the words of historian James McPherson, quote, their black population was too small to make a difference on the basis of representation, end quote. The threatened loss of congressional representation was not enough to blackmail racists in the North or in the South to, to grant the newly freed blacks the right to vote. Section 3. No person shall be a senator or representative in Congress, or elector of president and vice president, or hold any office, civil or military, under the United States, or under any state who, having previously taken an oath as a member of Congress, or as an officer of the United States, or as a member of any state legislature, or as an executive or judicial officer of any state, to support the Constitution of the United States, shall have engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the same, or given aid and or comfort to the enemies thereof. But Congress may vote, may by a vote of two-thirds of each house, remove such disability. The amendment's third section, which aroused the most controversy during the congressional debates, affected the voting rights of white Southerners. When the House of Representatives originally passed the 14th Amendment on May 10, 1866, the third section forbade ex-Confederates from voting in national elections until 1870. The Senate replaced this section with the current Section 3, which forbade Confederates who had previously taken an oath to protect the United States from holding any state or national office without Congress's permission. The new section, while seemingly more lenient than the original, had broader implications, according to Eric Foner, because, quote, the original provision had applied only to national elections, leaving the structure of state politics intact, while now, although not depriving rebels of the vote, the amendment made virtually the entire political leadership of the South ineligible for office, end quote. Before the war, most of the Confederacy's political leaders had held federal offices, had served in Congress, or had served in the military, and all of these federal positions had required oaths of allegiance. Therefore, in accordance with the new third section of the 14th Amendment, every one of those leaders would be deprived of the right to vote and hold office without Congress's permission. Proponents of the Senate's version hoped to bring about a sweeping change in Southern life and culture by forcing Southerners to elect new, and hopefully more progressive, political leaders who would embrace the nation's new racial order and submit to federal authority. This also allowed the Senate to skirt the issue of black suffrage and all the controversy that would follow. The Democratic press recognized that the amendment failed to guarantee equal suffrage and hoped to embarrass the Republicans with this fact. The San Francisco Daily Examiner wrote that the amendment, quote, is an open acknowledgement that Congress cannot force Negro suffrage on the states. In fact, it assumes that the states may continue to discriminate against a class in a community by denying them the elective franchise, end quote. Congress had intentionally sidestepped the suffrage issue in 1866, but under pressure from radicals and other suffrage advocates, finally would settle it in 1870 with the passage of the 15th Amendment, which gave all male citizens the right to vote, which was obviously problematic from a gender perspective and would require further amendment in 1920. Section 4 of the 14th Amendment. The validity of the public debt of the United States, authorized by law, including debts incurred for payment of pensions and bounties for services in suppressing insurrectional rebellion, shall not be questioned. 
But neither the United States nor any state shall assume or pay any debt or obligation incurred in aid of insurrection or rebellion against the United States, or any claim for the loss of emancipation of any slave. But all such debts, obligations, and claims shall be held illegal and void. So the radicals in Congress wanted to further punish the Confederates with this section. The fourth section was directed at those Southerners who had put money toward the war effort, which was pretty much anybody who had paid taxes to the Confederate government. Now, the Southern economy was in ruins by the end of the war, so there wasn't really much cash flowing about anyway, but that fourth section meant that there would be no bailouts for investors or pensions for soldiers or officers who participated in the rebellion. Section 5. The Congress shall have the power to enforce, by appropriate legislation, the provisions of this article. So how to enforce the new amendment? That's going to be at the core of lots of political debates for the following century and a half. So, the Senate approved the 14th Amendment with that new third section on June 8, 1866. The final vote fell along party lines with 33 yeas and 11 noes. The House approved the Senate version five days later, also along party lines. With the consent of both houses, the amendment was finally submitted to the states for ratification on June 13, 1866. Congress's success in passing the three Reconstruction Amendments and other civil rights bills were largely due to the fact that the 11 states that had seceded during the Civil War had still not been fully readmitted to the Union by the late 1860s and were unable to oppose the amendment's passage in Congress. President Johnson spoke out against the 14th Amendment on behalf of those states that had not been able to take part in the debates. He believed that the amendment was approved illegally because it, quote, was not submitted by the two houses for the approval of the president and that of the 36 states which constitute the United States. Eleven are excluded from representation in either house of Congress, although they have been entirely restored to their function as states in conformity with the organic law of the land, unquote. The fact that Congress did not have to get the president's permission to amend the Constitution seems to have been lost on Johnson, of course. Anyway, Johnson also noted that the, that the amendment had not been submitted to the people and that grave doubts could, quote, arise as to whether the action of Congress is in harmony with the sentiment of the people and whether state legislatures elected without reference to such an issue should be called upon by Congress to decide respecting the ratification of the proposed amendment, end quote. This was to become a common refrain among Democratic opponents to the amendment throughout the country, who claimed that only those state legislators that had been elected after the amendment was announced and submitted to the states should be eligible to ratify or reject the proposed law, because only those legislatures had received a mandate on the issue from their constituents. By June 1866, Johnson had so alienated the Republican Party that most of his support came from the Democratic Party, which also advocated states' rights and believed, like Johnson, that the Constitution barred the federal government from interfering in the affairs of any state. The proposed amendment took more than two years to be ratified by the requisite three-fourths of the states. On July 28, 1868, Secretary of State William Stewart declared that the amendment had been approved by 28 of the 37 states, including six southern states. Two more southern states ratified the amendment after July 28. Six former slave states rejected the amendment outright before July 28, but later ratified it. Only one state neither ratified nor rejected the 14th Amendment prior to its becoming part of the U.S. Constitution, California. Sorry, sorry. I said I wasn't going to turn this into a rehash of my MA thesis. Someday I'll record an audiobook version and post that on this podcast feed, if only to get it out of my system. It's going to be a real barn burner, I promise. So the big picture here is that the 14th Amendment made explicit a lot of the concepts that had been implicit in the U.S. Constitution before 1868, especially regarding citizenship, due process, and the equal protection of the laws, and it forced the states to honor those concepts for the first time. This constituted one of the largest expansions of federal power into the daily lives of people in all of American history. And some of the biggest issues in our modern political sphere come out of the new rights created in this 14th Amendment. So let's talk about a couple of those issues now. Birthright citizenship and abortion. With the ratification of the 14th Amendment, the United States found a simple and elegant way to determine someone's citizenship status. If a person was born on American soil, that person is a citizen of the U.S. who enjoys all of the rights and responsibilities, access to opportunities, 
and protection of the laws as any other citizen. With that definition of citizenship in place, local, state, and national governments were not allowed to pick and choose citizens based on skin color, economic status, gender, or later sexual orientation. If you're born here, you're a citizen. And that's not the only path to citizenship, but it's important in that it requires nothing from each citizen beyond proof of birth. Over the past few decades, opposition to birthright citizenship has grown among some politicians and media commentators who argue that foreigners often come to the United States to give birth to babies as a way to circumvent the normal immigration process. Now, the baby has automatic citizenship, and, so the argument goes, the parents might have an easier time becoming legal immigrants themselves if they have a citizen child. Opponents of birthright citizenship like to toss around terms like, quote, birth tourism, end quote, or, quote, anchor babies, unquote, when talking about this phenomenon. According to census records, about 8% of children born in the U.S. in 2008 were the offspring of undocumented immigrants, which means about 300,000 such children. Now, this is problematic to those opponents of birthright citizenship. Members of Congress from both parties have introduced bills over the years to eliminate birthright citizenship, but none of these have become law because of the obvious constitutional problem. They would have to pass a new constitutional amendment to change the language of the 14th Amendment. That's not enough to stop politicians who like to gin up their base with outrage about immigration, of course, but that's a topic for a whole other podcast. Now, the second modern political issue that has its origins in the 14th Amendment is the right to an abortion. Roe v. Wade, the Supreme Court decision in 1973 that legalized abortion, held that women had a right to privacy regarding medical decisions like abortion under the 14th Amendment. In Roe, the court argued that anti-abortion laws placed undue burdens on women's medical decisions that is unconstitutional under the 14th Amendment's Due Process Clause. Supreme Court Justice Harry Blackmun argued in the Roe decision that, quote, this right of privacy, whether it be founded in the 14th Amendment's concept of personal liberty and restrictions upon state action, as we feel it is, or, as the District Court determined in the Ninth Amendment's reservation of rights to the people, is broad enough to encompass a woman's decision whether to terminate her pregnancy, end quote. The Texas anti-abortion law at issue in Roe, which, quote, accepts from criminality only a life-saving procedure on behalf of the mother, without regard to pregnancy stage or without recognition of the other interests involved, is violative of the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment, end quote. Supreme Court Justice William Rehnquist, in his dissent in Roe, noted that the amendment's creators made no mention of abortion, even though there were three dozen laws on the books in various states regarding abortion back in 1866. Almost exactly 50 years later, in 2022, a very differently constituted Supreme Court issued a new decision on abortion uh, in Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization that followed Rehnquist's line of thinking. Justice Samuel Alito argued in the Dobbs decision that, quote, the Constitution makes no reference to abortion, and no such right is implicitly protected by any constitutional provision, including the one on which the defenders of Roe and Casey now chiefly rely, the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. Channeling the ghost of William Rehnquist, Alito argued that until the latter part of the 20th century, such a right was entirely unknown in American law. Indeed, when the 14th Amendment was adopted, three-quarters of the states made abortion a crime at all stages of pregnancy. End quote. And thus... Federal protection for abortion was overturned, and the issue was returned to the states, which means that you and I were going to get bombarded with political advertising over the next few years as each state wrestles with the abortion issue through legislation, ballot initiatives, and state constitutional amendments. I live in Ohio, where a proposed amendment to the state constitution uh, to protect the right to abortion will be on the ballot in November of this year, and the commercials are going to be just awful. Oh, and I guess there's a third political issue uh, today that centers on the 14th Amendment. Remember that third section, which said that someone who had taken an oath to protect the U.S. and the Constitution, but also participated in a rebellion or insurrection, would be ineligible for federal office? Yeah, that provision may cause headaches for former President Donald Trump, who is running for a second term in 2024 after losing the 2020 election. The January 6th riots, or insurrection, depending on, which, on how you want to call it, which Trump egged on from the sidelines, may fit the definition of rebellion or insurrection as outlined in Section 3. According to some legal scholars, Trump may be ineligible for federal office uh, because of his role in that event. 
As of a few days ago, Republicans in Colorado and liberals in Minnesota have filed lawsuits to remove Trump from the ballot in those states because of his alleged support for that insurrection. Historians and other analysts believe that those lawsuits are not likely to succeed because Section 3 is pretty vague on details and Trump has not been convicted of insurrection or rebellion. But get your popcorn ready as Trump's supporters and opponents fight it out in court. Okay, I think I've talked to your ear off enough for this sunny Sunday. Thank you all for joining us today. This episode appears on the Working Historians podcast feed, and you can subscribe to Working Historians on any podcast app, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Podbean, Amazon Music, Pandora, or whatever else you prefer. That way you won't miss any episodes and you'll continue to hear about all the other cool stuff that historians do with their lives. This podcast does not represent the views of Southern New Hampshire University. If you have any questions or comments for this or any of our other podcasts, send us a message to workinghistorians at gmail.com. I'm Rob Denning, and I think I'll go enjoy the fruits of the 21st Amendment to the Constitution with a sparkly rum and coke. Happy Constitution Day, everybody.